amen. I was telling Brother Dameron that I think you have probably some of the finest church music in America. And, I, and I'm a musician myself, folks. Uh, and so, amen. I mean, we, you just have wonderful, wonderful music here. Don't take it for granted. Uh, it, it's a great, great blessing. And uh, it's just been a blessing to my heart just to listen to the choir and, and uh, the music here uh, through this day. Well, make sure you stop at the book table. Uh, things are thinning out back there. And uh, one book you may want to consider, I, I've written a number of books on the Bible issue, the King James Bible issue. And uh, uh, there's a trilogy of them, uh, Touch Not the Unclean Thing. Uh, the next book in the series is God's Perfect Book, and the latest is Neither Oldest Nor Best. Now, if you can only get one, get this one. Uh, but it, it shows how that the, the foundation under all the modern Bibles, the NIV, the ESV, the ASV, the RSV, and, and on and on and on, uh, the, the, the two manuscripts that they are based upon, in fact, are fraudulent. They're fakes. They're counterfeits. I mean, literally. And yet we have been told for 150 years they are the oldest and best manuscripts. This book is entitled Neither Oldest Nor Best. Well, anyway, it's there. So much for the commercial. <laughs> Take your Bible and turn to Romans 1 this evening. Romans chapter 1. A familiar passage. Romans 1 beginning in verse 16. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, that is in the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Father, tonight, as we would look to your word, again, my God, I would ask that in this hour your name might be lifted up and be glorified. And Father, that your people might be strengthened and encouraged. And Father, that this great church uh, would, would take a step forward. And Father, if there be one here tonight who knows not Christ as their Savior, May even this evening be the day of their salvation. Bless in this hour, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul here begins in talking about the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, the word gospel literally means good news. It's how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It's for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of Christ. And Paul was not ashamed of the gospel, nor should we. And I watch Christians who are embarrassed to bow their head in prayer uh, at a restaurant. Or they're, they're ashamed or embarrassed to let other know, others know that they are saved. Say to the guys at work, the gals at work where you work, know that you're saved. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's our blessed hope. It's why we are here. It's what Christianity is all about. And in this short passage this evening, the apostle goes on to describe several other aspects that pertain to the gospel. And so let's look at four aspects of the gospel tonight. Number one, the power of the gospel. Notice he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power, the power of God unto salvation. Folks, we have a powerful spiritual weapon. Uh, the word of God, the gospel. As I said this morning, it changes lives. And uh, I'm sure your pastor could stand and tell you story after story. And uh, let me just tell you a few more stories tonight of, of people that I've watched the gospel and our Lord change their lives. I remember a fellow who was in my first pastorate many years ago. His name was Lou Ward. And uh, Lou came to me one day. Uh, he had gotten saved just about the time I came to be the pastor there. I had nothing to do with it, but uh, that's uh, when, when he was led to Christ. But he came to me later and said, Pastor, uh, I want you to know I've only been drunk twice in my life. 
Once was for seven years, and the other time was for 11 years. Well, he was a drunk. He was an alcoholic. He was about to lose his wife. He was about to lose his home. He was about to lose his family. He was about to lose his business. And he was a mess. But praise God, one day Lou Ward got saved. And he never touched another drop of alcohol again. And in due season, he became a deacon in our church. I mean, he's another guy that got, when he got saved, folks, he hit the ground running. And uh, didn't miss a service. He was there. He became a deacon and eventually the chairman of the deacons after I left the church. And meanwhile, along the way, he became a Christian millionaire. Now, folks, the gospel and the Word of God changes people's lives. There is power there. And all the government social programs and all the government spending never changes a heart on the inside. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember a guy back uh, in, in my home church. Uh, I, I was born in Minnesota, but I, I consider my hometown and home church to be in Pekin, Illinois. My father was the pastor there for uh, over 31 years. And it was the, the town and the church I grew up in from grade school to junior high school to high school to college through seminary. And then I came back when, and uh, was an associate pastor with my father for 10 years. And uh, did everything bus, from bus ministry to youth ministry. And, and it was a very diverse ministry in those years. But I remember one, uh, I guess it was fall season. I'm, I don't remember what time of year it was, but I'll say fall season. And uh, the, the church youth pastor, which I was not then, uh, but he planned a, a big youth rally on Friday night, a big youth activity. And the whole purpose was to bring unsaved kids in to hear the gospel. And one of our bus workers went out and he brought in a young man that Friday evening. I noticed him. I, I didn't really get to know him, but I noticed him. And, and uh, he had hair almost down to his waist. He was into the drug trade and, and, uh, and frankly was a mess. Well, that night, his name was Curtis Kingsland. That night, Curtis got saved. Well, that was Friday night. Sunday morning, as my custom usually was, I would be standing out there on the curb waiting as each bus came in and, uh, and greet the kids and greet the adults and, and greet whoever, the workers, as, as they got off the bus. And uh, that, that particular bus route pulled up and a fellow came in, and uh, I said, hi, what's your name? He said, don't you remember me? I'm Curtis. I got saved on Friday night. Well, he'd gone on Saturday and got his hair cut. Looked completely different. Now, nobody said, Curtis, you need to go and get a haircut. But folks, the Word of God was working in his life. And it changed his life. He went off to Bible college, graduated from Bible college, and has been serving the Lord out on the East Coast for about the last probably 30 years, I would gather. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The underlying word there is dunamis. It's whence our word dynamo or dynamite comes. And uh, not far from here are, are steel mills. I'm, I'm not sure what steel company it is, but Burns Harbor overnight area, is that correct? Uh, well, did, did you ever wonder where the, the, the iron ore comes from that goes into the blast furnaces there, the taconite? Well, it comes from Duluth, Minnesota. And there are vast iron mines north of Duluth. It's called the Minnesota Iron Range. And uh, they, they, it, it's open pit mining, uh, and they mine it there, and it, it's, it gets, goes by rail down to Duluth, to the harbor there, and by ships. Uh, down to, to, to your area here, to Cleveland, to, to Detroit, and, and, and the Great Lakes region. But anyway, uh, I've never seen what I'm about to tell you other than watching it on television, uh, on the news. But they will drill a lattice work of holes in a, a, a huge uh, uh, rocky side of these open pit mines. I don't know how many sticks of dynamite go in or how many holes go in. But when the, 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 the moment comes, and I don't know if they say fire in the hole, maybe they do, but when the time comes, a button is pushed, a plunger is pushed, something happens, and folks, that whole heel explodes. And then the machinery goes in and, and digs it out, and they start processing it. And finally, you get your iron ore down here. 
but that is power. Imagine that, blowing up a hillside. And it goes on every day, uh, day in and day out. I'm not ashamed. But you see, it's the gospel that is the power of God. And in witnessing, I believe we need to use the gospel. I, somebody gave me a video several years ago of a well-known evangelical type of evangelist. And uh, he, was, he had himself recorded witnessing to students. I, I'm not sure if it was UCLA or, or Southern Cal, but, but a major university in Southern California. But his approach to witnessing was using logic and philosophy to try and win college students to Christ. Now, folks, there's no power in logic. And there's no power in philosophy. But God said, my word shall not return again unto me void. Use the scripture when you witness. It's the sword of the spirit. It is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces to the heart. I like the old Romans road. It's just scripture. Uh, five or six verses of scripture, depending on what variation you use. And so we touch here tonight on the power of the gospel. But number two this evening, the principle of the gospel. Notice, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To everyone that believeth. Faith is the password of salvation. We live in a day and an age where you have passwords and probably lots of passwords. I put a password in on a, a, a site this afternoon I, that I had to do. And uh, you, you got one of these things in your pocket or your purse, and, and you probably have a password for that. On my laptop, just to get into it, I have to use a password. We all have passwords. So folks, the password of salvation is faith. Trusting Jesus Christ. Trusting Him and Him alone. God is not impressed with human endeavor or human merit or human uh, uh, effort but he's impressed by faith. And we read in Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please him. God is pleased when we trust him. We turn to him and trust him. And in regard to our salvation, faith is relying on Christ to save us. Everything else is relying on ourselves. Talked this morning about being a good person or even getting baptized. Folks, that's relying on ourselves and not on him. There is no power in me trying to save myself, but there's great power when I trust, and when I trusted Jesus Christ to save me 54 and a half years ago. Faith is not walking an aisle. Now, I'm, I'm all for people walk, walking an aisle, coming forward at the end of the service. But folks, walking down an aisle doesn't save you. Faith is not repeating a prayer. Now, oft times we'll encourage or coach a, 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 someone we're witnessing to uh, to pray the sinner's prayer and we'll kind of help them along, but it's not the prayer that saves them. Prayer is just the manifestation of faith. It's the vehicle of faith. But God's simple requirement is to simply turn to Christ and trust Him. It's so simple a five-year-old child can understand it. Uh, trusting Him to everyone that believeth. And notice, he says, to everyone that believeth. The gospel is not for a select elect. It's for everyone. To everyone that believes. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Matthew, and that's by, by the way, that's 2 Peter 3, 9, in Matthew 18, 14, uh, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, if it's not God's will for a little one to perish, folks, I think we can extrapolate to say it's not God's will for a big one to perish either. He's not willing that any should perish. The gospel is to everyone that believeth. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful that one day I asked Jesus Christ to save me. And he did so. 54 and a half years ago to everyone that believeth. And by the way, I think that little phrase there in Romans 1, 
uh, and uh, verse 16, pretty well neutralizes and dissolves the, the nefarious doctrines of Calvinism. It's to everyone that believeth, not just uh, those who, for which an unlimited, or rather a limited atonement, uh, the, the elect Christ died for, so they say. Folks, that's heresy. That's false doctrine, but it's taught all across the land today, even in fundamental Baptist churches. But notice, number one, the power of the gospel. Number two, the principle of the gospel. Number three tonight, the primacy of the gospel. Notice verse 17. For therein, the, the predicate to that, or the antecedent, rather I should say, the antecedent is the gospel. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Isn't that interesting? The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God was satisfied when Christ died in our place there on the cross. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, just a page or so over in your Bible, uh, there we read, whom, and that's speaking of Christ, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, when God justifies us through faith, his righteousness is revealed. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He is just, incidentally, that's a direct synonym of the word righteous. He is just or he is righteous and the justifier of all who believe in Jesus. And therefore, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And we're getting a little bit now deeply into Pauline theology. It sometimes is not the easiest to follow. But the simple thought is that the righteousness of God is by faith. What an amazing truth. You and I can have the, the righteousness of God in our lives, and it's through trusting in Him. Uh, and, of course, we are touching here on the greater principle of justification or being justified by faith. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The righteousness of God in him. Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Isn't that interesting? It's witnessed by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. In Philippians 3.9, the apostle wrote, and uh, to be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And I, I kind of get the idea, folks, I, you know, in reading these, that the righteousness of God is by faith. We're saved by faith. We're justified by faith. And again, what an amazing truth. I can have the very righteousness of God of an infinitely holy God, and it's by trusting in Christ. And God transfers to me His righteousness when we in turn trust in Christ. God no longer sees my sin, but He sees the righteousness of Christ in me because I'm now in Christ. I, I, I'm well aware that the, that is a little complex Pauline theology, but it's, it's a Bible theology the primacy of the gospel. But then notice a fourth thought here tonight, and that is the uh, principle of the gospel, or the process of the gospel. Notice here in, in the end of verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of faith revealed from faith to faith. Isn't that interesting? From faith to faith. And the apostle here is, is discussing actually two different types of faith. And both are very important to us. Now, the first aspect here is saving faith. That's where we begin. That's where the Christian life starts. Back in 
the fall of 1966. I was a, a, a student at, at the old Pillsbury Baptist Bible College. Uh, that is no more. Uh, that's another story for another day, but, but it, it, it no longer exists. And I was there in Bible college. I wasn't sure why I was there. Uh, I had not been a, 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 a uh, well, let's put it this way. I had been a rebellious teenager, let me put it that way. And, but I was there. And on that particular Thursday morning, somebody got up and preached in chapel. I don't remember who it was. I don't remember what he preached about. But I went back to my dormitory room, and there that Thursday morning, I laid down on my bed. I had an open hour, and my roommates were not there. Laid down on my bed and, and began to think. And thoughts started crossing my mind. Now, in hindsight, I believe it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. My parents were at home praying for me, and my mother in particular was praying for me. And the thought crossed my mind, Dave, what would happen to you if you died today? To which, in thinking, I don't think I responded out loud, but I thought, well, I'd go to heaven. And that still small voice said, why? And I thought, well, I got saved when I was five years old. And then that still small voice said, well, what happened then? Well, when I was five years old, my parents had gone to a revival meeting, and, and, and the details I'm about to tell you now were, were revealed to me later by my mother, because I surely don't, didn't remember all this stuff from when I was five years old. But my parents had gone to a revival meeting at a place called the Dowling Avenue Baptist Church, which was uh, on, on the north side of Minneapolis. And there that night, an evangelist by the name of Ernest Rockstead, an old Swedish Baptist preacher, got up and preached. Now, as five-year-olds often do, I leaned against, I suppose, my mother and fell asleep and slept through most of the service. But at the end, and then the preacher said, all stand, I woke up and stood up, and he gave the invitation, and somebody took me forward and went off in the room off to the side, and, and, and then I came out a few minutes later, five minutes later, and they told me I was saved. Now, the only problem with that is, to this day, I have zero recollection of what took place in that little room. Nothing. I think I was still half asleep. Now, I believe five-year-olds can get saved. I just don't believe this five-year-old got saved. And so I laid there on my, my dormitory room bed <clears throat> that particular morning in 1966 and contemplating, and the, and the Spirit of God was shooting thoughts through my mind. And I, I, I thought, well, I got saved when I was five, but then uh, the still small voice said to me, then what happened? I had no recollection. And I'd had enough Bible teaching in, 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 in the church and in the Bible college that I was in to know that just walking down an aisle and going off in the side room doesn't save you. And so I laid there and contemplated that. And then the thought slowly began to descend upon me, well, if that is what I'm relying upon to be saved, I probably never got saved. And then there is the, the corollary thought that comes from that. And if I've never been saved, I'm on my way to hell. And for the first time in my life, I began to contemplate that. I had never, to my recollection, ever contemplated the fact that I might be on my way to hell. And so I laid there and, and thought about that. And then a, a brilliant thought crossed my mind. I said to myself, well, everybody th thinks you're saved, Dave, so just keep faking it. Brilliant thought, right? And the still small voice said, yeah, Dave, but when you die, it'll be your funeral. Well, I knew what I needed to do. That morning, I, I, I knelt down beside my dormitory bed. Again, my roommates weren't there. I was there alone. 
And I prayed and I said, dear Lord, I'm not sure if I've ever been saved before. I don't think I am. And dear Lord, will you please save me? Well, there weren't any bells ring or lights flash or, or any bolt of lightning. But folks, he saved me. He said, how do you know that? Because the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there was a peace that swept over me because I had taken care of it. I had settled the matter. I trusted Christ as my Savior that day. Prior to that point, I had no interest in witnessing to anyone. But shortly thereafter, I, I, I worked in a, uh, an electronics shop there in Owatonna. I had a little training on the side, and that is, it more or less is a hobby, but, but nevertheless, uh, I worked at an electronics place called Mastercraft Electronics. And uh, they, they not only fixed up, but they sold TVs and, and, and stereos. And back, folks, that was back in the day when they fixed things rather than just replace things. But anyway, I worked with a guy uh, in, in the back room there. His name was Jewel Larson, good old Norwegian. And one Sunday afternoon, I talked to a buddy. This was in January now. Uh, and, and I didn't have a working car at the time, and I said, hey, George, will you drive me out, and, and let's, I want to go witness to this guy I work with. And uh, that cold sub-zero January Sunday afternoon, we drove out in the countryside, long story, finally found his place, and I knew it simply because I could see the panel truck in the driveway that said Mastercraft Electronics on it. And in the spirit, I wanted to witness to him in the flesh. I was scared to death. Went and knocked on the door, and in the spirit, I hoped to, to, to talk to him in the, in the flesh. I was saying, I hope he's not home, I hope he's not home. Scared to death. And the door opened, and he invited us in. We sat down around his kitchen table, and I fumbled and stumbled and muddled, muttered and mumbled, and, and folks, it was the most awkward, uh, clumsy presentation of the gospel he ever, he ever heard. Well, I got done with going through the Romans Road, which I had been taught in, in a class I'd taken there in the college, and, and, and so I turned to him and said, well, uh, Jewel, you want to get saved? You know, real smooth and, and diplomatic. I just put it to him point blank. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while. Yes, I would. I'd like to get saved. I looked at my buddy who was, a, was I think, a senior, and I was a sophomore. I, I looked at him and I, as if to say, now what I do? <laughs> well, he got saved that day, praise God. But the point I'm trying to make is, folks, my, my interests began to change. I had no interest in witnessing before I got saved. And uh, not long thereafter, uh, began to, uh, another guy and I there in the Bible college went to, it was called the, the Red Wing School for Boys in Minnesota. It was, it, it was a reformatory for juvenile delinquents. I don't, they don't use that term much anymore, but they did back then. And uh, we went there on Saturdays and preached the gospel. And then we graduated to the big house. Went to the Minnesota State Penitentiary at Bayport, Minnesota, the big prison. And for about uh, two years there, I, I'd, I'd go every Saturday and preach the gospel. Uh, but the point is, the gospel changed me, but I got saved by faith. And so we read here from faith to faith. Now, what is the second part of faith Paul talks about? Well, it's pretty well illustrated in the text. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so after we get saved by faith, then we need to learn to live by faith. And I used to tell our people, and I still say it when I preach, I think it's easier to get saved by faith than it is to live by faith. I mean, we, we go down the pathway of life as a Christian, and one, uh, the day comes when there's more month than money, and uh, we get all shook up. Well, folks, God's promised to meet our needs. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And we need to learn to live by faith and take God at his word. Living by faith at times means obeying by faith. You go to Hebrews chapter 11 and read the, the, the various uh, uh, men there in the, the great uh, hall of faith who obeyed by faith. But we get saved and we find out that you need to get baptized. And uh, some folks are scared to death of, of water. My mother-in-law, a uh, long story, uh, maybe one of these nights I'll give Pam's testimony, but uh, Pam's uh, mother w was brought up in the home of an atheist. And, uh, and uh, she had, I mean, no religion, much less true biblical Christianity. 
but we had the privilege one day of leading her to Christ when she was about 70 years old. She was scared to death of water. She did not know how to swim. Terrified of it. <laughs> but she got baptized. And sometimes we have to obey by faith. Tithing. Folks, tithing is an act of obedience. The Bible says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, God has commanded us to tithe. But we often have to do it by faith because we look at the checkbook and we look at the, our, our bank account and say, I can't afford to tithe. But folks, we step out by faith and honor the Lord and, and put him first in our lives. He will bless and prosper our finances. It's a step of faith as well as a step of obedience. And it goes on to say uh, that he may open up the windows of heaven and pour uh, you out a blessing such as shall not be room to receive it. Uh, it's living by faith. And so living by faith is trusting him for every problem, whether it's a financial problem, whether it's a family problem, whether it's a health problem. Folks, I've learned to live by faith uh, on the matter of health this past year. Trusting him, taking him at his word. And you go through the Gospels, and, and not all of but many of the times when our Lord healed somebody, he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Uh, Thy faith hath made thee whole. In James 5, it says, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And we need to learn to trust God when health crises come and ask him to, to help us. We worry. I mean, someone says, uh, why pray when we can worry? <laughs> but the truth is, why worry when we can pray? Amen. Taking all our problems to him, casting all our care on him, for he careth for you. What a wonderful promise. We can take any problem. And I, over the years, have told my people that there is no problem that's too big for God to solve. Right. And we come to a hard spot in life. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's some other issue, brokenhearted over a family situation. And in our mind, we may not articulate this, but in our mind we figure there's no hope, there's no way, it, it, I'm cooked, it's over, it's done. Uh, and we forget that God can solve any problem if we come to Him and trust Him. And so today, here in Romans 1, uh, the book of Romans, by the way, if you'll trace it through, uh, emphasizes the concept of righteousness. But here I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Uh, and he goes on to say, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, by the way, in Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. Praise God, it is so simple. Trusting him and him alone. Let's stand for prayer. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, no one is looking about.